Thank you all for coming. My name is Shannon Cohen. I'm a product manager at Pivotal working on Cloud Foundry. And I'm joined today with, uh, by Doug Davis from IBM, who's been working on Kubernetes. We also have some of the uh, team with us here in the audience who has been contributing to the working group I'll describe now. Uh, before I get to the, the meat of the presentation, I'd like to uh, start with a couple of, uh, of foundational concepts. Some of this may be review, and I appreciate your patience. Uh, I'd like to start with motivations. Um, we, we know that uh, application development teams require services, and these range from application dependencies to service with, services which enable the entire application development lifecycle. We found that managed services uh, enable application development teams to concentrate on their application code rather than operating these services, which can be very costly. We also know that self-service, on-demand, marketplace services increase developer velocity and minimize time to deliver value to market. As many of you are aware, Cloud Foundry has a marketplace of this kind. Each deployment of Cloud Foundry, in fact, has its own marketplace with admins uh, adding services to the marketplace based on application de uh, developer demand. Uh, admins uh, have uh, control of access to services and plans by organization and can optionally allow developers to bring their own services to the marketplace. The marketplace provides a highly integrated self-service and uh, on-demand application developer user experience and uh, over the years, uh, a rich ecosystem of services, compatible services, uh, has developed, enabled by a uh, simple, uh, well-documented API, which fil facilitates integration uh, between the marketplace and service providers. The uh, API, we call the Service Broker API, and as this is uh, familiar to most of you, I'll briefly summarize it here. Uh, the components, uh, uh, service providers implement uh, a few API endpoints for which Cloud Foundry is the client, and uh, components that implement these endpoints we refer to as service brokers. Service brokers can be hosted anywhere the platform can reach them and provide a catalog of services, plans, and user-facing metadata exposed in the Cloud Foundry marketplace. The real value of the broker API, though, is in <clears throat> abstracting uh, service-specific lifecycle operations from the platform. Uh, service brokers translate generic requests from uh, the platform to service-specific ones for operations such as create, update, delete, and generate credentials. The uh, Platform also provides a, um, uh, service brokers can also uh, uh, offer many services and plans, and many service brokers can be registered with uh, the marketplace so that the catalog of services available to uh, users of Cloud Foundry is the aggregate of all services offered by all brokers. And the platform then provides a homogenous user experience for application developers managing these services. So this model has worked fairly well for quite a while, but we still have some goals. And those include uh, increasing the choice of services offered to application developers in Cloud Foundry, enhancing the API to uh, offer new service use cases to application developers, and increasing adoption of Cloud Foundry. We have found, however, that reaching out to service providers one by one is labor intensive. And uh, not surprisingly, we've seen that the adoption uh, of compatible services or, or the availability of compatible services has grown as the popula uh, popularity of Cloud Foundry has grown. <clears throat> so we've been thinking, uh, how can we make uh, the investment and integration in this API even more compelling? Last year, we heard that several open source communities were interested in adopting the Service Broker API uh, to uh, enable marketplaces that they were designing for their platforms. We had discussions with representatives from Kubernetes, OpenShift, Bluemix, and Google uh, 
about uh, how we could uh, enable them to adopt the service broker API uh, for these marketplaces they were designing, and how we could work together to enhance the API uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, before I proceed, I'll address an obvious question. Uh, many have uh, view the Cloud Foundry Services Marketplace as a differentiator in an increasingly competitive market. Uh, but we believe, uh, and some have asked why we would uh, uh, assist um, these uh, platforms in enabling this feature. Well, we believe that uh, with more flat platforms supporting uh, this broker API, it becomes more compelling for service providers to invest in implementing the uh, integration. And ultimately, we expect the ecosystem of compatible services to grow uh, and uh, enable what really is our, uh, our goal is increasing developer velocity through uh, increasing, increasing choice of uh, compatible services. So with that in mind, uh, last year, the Cloud Foundry Foundation created the Open Service Broker API uh, project managed by a Cloud Foundry Foundation PMC, Project Management Committee. Uh, and the API spec, the members of, of the PMC are represented by Fujitsu, Google, IBM, Pivotal, Red Hat, and SAP, representing Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes and other platforms. The uh, API spec itself uh, for the broker uh, API has been moved from a Cloud Foundry repo to a new GitHub organization for the project. And uh, goals for this working group include evolving the API into a cross-platform community specification and increasing adoption by platforms and service, bro uh, service providers to, uh, again, ultimately uh, increase choice available to uh, application developers. So since then, uh, the working group has been learning to work together. Uh, some of us are new to creating uh, standards, but fortunately we have some members in our working group with a great amount of experience in this. Uh, we shared our respective priorities and fortunately found that uh, the top priorities for our respective platforms uh, overlapped. Uh, so um, there hasn't been a great de deal of disagreement over priorities. Uh, most of our work has been in gathering uh, requirements and discussing use cases and uh, design documents, uh, arriving at uh, uh, solutions that we agree on to meet these use cases. And we're developing a release process that continues to require implementation uh, of uh, new features in a platform. Uh, currently, that's been uh, for, uh, Cloud Foundry, but increasingly, that may be Kubernetes also to validate the usability of uh, API interactions. I'd like to give you a, a, a quick look into uh, the roadmap that, uh, for features that we have uh, coming in um, uh, upcoming versions of the spec. The first thing we identified was that there are a few Cloud Foundry specific uh, aspects to the API. Fortunately, there weren't that many. Um, in particular, Cloud Foundry sends an org and space ID in the provision request, and uh, Kubernetes and other platforms uh, don't have a notion of those fields. So we're introducing a new field that uh, will allow platforms to send a profile of information uh, to brokers. And uh, while we'll deprecate these current fields, we won't remove them um, as our, uh, uh, our charter is to make additive changes only. In the next major version of the spec, whenever that may be, those will be removed. The biggest feature that we've been uh, discussing recently is to um, meet the use case that um, app developers want a richer experience around management of service configuration options. Brokers uh, currently may uh, support uh, arbitrary number of configuration options, but discovery of those is currently left out of band uh, through documentation or otherwise. We've been uh, designing a schema based on the JSON schema standard, which would enable broker authors to declare uh, supported uh, configuration options, and platforms would pass those through to platform user-facing clients 
so that those clients could offer the uh, much richer uh, user-facing interactions uh, regarding these configuration options. We've also identified that uh, there are now uh, valid use cases for adding some get endpoints uh, for instance and binding uh, to allow retrieval of these configuration options and uh, credentials. We imagine that these get endpoints could eventually be used for uh, uh, other aspects of, of instance and binding state. We've also heard that the, um, the specified mechanism for authorization and authentication in broker interactions of basic auth uh, is, uh, is both too prescriptive and undesirable in many environments. Uh, we intend to relax uh, that constraint, as well as uh, identify uh, um, a few popular uh, mechanisms that we might identify ways to facilitate. In particular, um, we found that while we don't necessarily need to add anything to the spec about uh, where your OAuth2 uh, token server um, may be, we could uh, standardize on the scopes that uh, brokers and token servers and, uh, and platforms use uh, to uh, authorize a request between platforms and brokers. We've heard that uh, broker authors would like to know the identity of uh, the, uh, the originating end user and uh, are thinking through uh, how to facilitate that, both uh, for the purposes of authorization or billing but also to enable broker authors to make calls into the platform on a user's behalf. Many, of, uh, m many brokers are offering persistent data services, uh, though not all, and uh, we're thinking through how we can enable broker authors to uh, execute backup and restore operations. Um, we have not yet decided yet whether those uh, should be facilitated with uh, first-class endpoints on the API, or whether we might consider a more generic mechanism to allow uh, brokers to declare arbitrary um, supported actions. And finally, uh, we mean to extend the asynchronous support to bind and unbind, uh, as some broker authors are uh, making calls for those operations to uh, asynchronous backend systems. With that, I'd like to invite Doug Davis from IBM uh, to the stage to give us an update on Kubernetes Service Catalog uh, project, uh, which uh, supports the Service Broker API. Right. Doug, Thanks, thank Shane. you. <clears throat> Is volume okay? All right. All right, thanks. Um, as, as Shannon said, I'm Doug Davis from IBM. Um, I've been lucky enough to actually work on uh, Cloud Foundry in the past, then Docker, and now Kubernetes. So I'm really excited to be able to bring this aspect of uh, Cloud Foundry to the Kubernetes community, with, along with other, other people in the, the Kubernetes community. So that's all great. Now, I know that this is a Cloud Foundry audience, so if you're familiar with Kubernetes, forgive me for really, really oversimplifying it, but I wanted to at least give you a quick intro for those who don't know Kubernetes, what it's all about. At its very basic core level, you can think of Kubernetes as basically a database with a REST API in front of it. And that's basically it at its core. Okay, so what you're gonna have is over here, oops, sorry, I guess you can't see it, I'm sorry. So anyway, what you're gonna have is the Kubernetes client talking to an API server, which talks to a database. And that's basically it in terms of the core functionality of how the user interacts with the system. It's an asynchronous model, meaning you put things into the database and then the client basically gets returned back for most cases, there are some there are exceptions. Beyond that though, what they have are these set of watchers or controllers who monitor basically the database and look for changes in there and then act upon those changes. So for, the, so for example, if you ask for three instances of a particular application, but it only detects one, it will bring up two more. <clears throat> so that's very much you know, matching the desired state model that you see in Cloud Foundry as well. But the important thing here is that um, the, when you think about Kubernetes versus Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry tries to abstract these things away from the end user. Kubernetes tries to actually take the other approach and for the most part exposes the end user, if they choose to, to all the underlying system resources. And that's a very different model. 
And the re this is important because I'm going to start explaining some of the additional resources to you. So if you start playing with this in Kubernetes, I didn't want you to be surprised by seeing these things that are there in Cloud Foundry, but they're just hidden from you. But in, in, in Kubernetes, they will be exposed. The other, the other key points to keep in mind when thinking about Cloud Foundry versus Docker is, I'm sorry, <laughs> Cloud Foundry versus Kubernetes, is Kubernetes has a notion of pods. While they do use uh, containers, they allow you to group containers together into what they call pods, because they realize in many cases you want to have multiple containers sort of sitting side by side on the same host working together. And that is sort of the smallest unit of deployment that they have. Um, so to keep in mind they have pods instead of containers. And lastly, in order to identify your application, they actually don't have the notion of application. What they have are labels that you can put onto pods. So when you want to take an action on your, quote, application, what you're really doing is saying, go find all the pods out there with this particular label and take this action for me. Okay, so it's an important thing to know that the notion of, app, of application really doesn't exist inside Kubernetes for the most part. All right, so with that in mind, let's keep going. Now, so um, in order for Kubernetes to support a uh, service broker, we had to add some new resources to the data model. Now, for a variety of reasons, we decided not to extend the core Kubernetes model itself. It's actually a, an add-on feature. Um, partially because we weren't 100% sure we wanted to pull, in, pull into the core yet, but also they wanted to kind of use us as a guinea pig for some of the newer features that they're adding. And I'll talk about that in terms of how they allow people to extend the model. And so we got to be a guinea pig for some of those things. But let's start talking about some of these core features. And uh, for most part, these should be very similar to the ones you see inside Cloud Foundry. It's just some of these may not be exposed as first class citizens in Cloud Foundry, but they are there. So for example, you can, in Kubernetes, create a broker resource, which is nothing more than um, the metadata about where the broker lives, right? It's URL, uh, user ID and password. And then once this resource is created, typically by an admin in the Kubernetes model, a controller will detect it, and then under the covers, go off and talk to the broker, get the catalog, and then populate the Kubernetes resource model with that catalog, right? So, once that catalog gets, or as the catalog gets created, what you're going to see are service classes appear. Now, service class is the same thing as a, quote, service, other than the reason we had to use the word class on the end is because service itself was actually taken already by the Kubernetes model, and we didn't want confusion there. But these are Im created implicitly by the controller. Uh, the end users don't create these. And within the service class itself, you'll have all the various plans that you guys should know about if you deal with services in, cloud, in a Cloud Foundry. So then we also have an instance object. Now this actually is created by an end user. So when they want to provision an instance of say MongoDB, they'll go off and create an instance object inside the Kubernetes model. And that has basically the metadata necessary for the controller to notice it, go off and talk to the, to the particular broker, come back with whatever information the broker is going to return and stick it back in that object. So this object is just sort of a metadata object more than anything else. Just it registers the existence of the instance itself from the user's perspective that it wants it, and then the information from the broker itself about what it actually got created. And then finally, we have the binding. So much in the same way Cloud Foundry links applications to service instances, that's what we have here inside of Kubernetes. Um, the only major difference here is uh, inside uh, Kubernetes, the credentials are actually stored in a first-class object called secrets. Think of it as nothing more than a, a, a key-value store, um, but that is, it's, just, it's just encrypted. Now, inside Kubernetes, though, you can take these secrets and bind them to your application or your pods in a variety of ways. So, for example, you can take all the keys and have them appear as uh, environment variables or you can have them appear as a volume mount. That way, you don't have to deal with the security potential problems around the environment variables, but you can access them as a volume mount there. So there are some options there. And we make use of those, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. Now, everything I talked about here um, so far has talked about extending the model sort of outside the core. There is one feature that we did actually add to the core itself, and that's called the pod preset. Now, a pod preset allows you to define a resource, obviously called pod preset, which says, look for any new pod that's getting created in the system, and based upon the labels you see in that pod, do something to it. In particular, it allows you to add environment variables to the pod, or it allows you to mount volumes in there. And as, as hopefully you should be able to see, this is going to be very important to us, because as we need to inject credentials from the binding into the pods for an application, we're going to make use of this itself. 
So while this resource was created um, because of the service catalog work, it, we made it generic enough so it could be used by other application uh, or other uses of Kubernetes. It's not app, uh, service catalog specific. Um, yep, I already mentioned that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about bindings because I think this was sort of the the, the piece of Kubernetes that might be slightly different from, uh, from Cloud Foundry. And on the top right-hand corner of the screen, you can actually see a sample YAML file that describes a binding. But very much like the Cloud Foundry model, a binding is just a linkage between an application and the, uh, the, uh, the binding, or the, the credentials itself. Uh, so in this particular case, what you're gonna see in red is a pointer to the instance itself, so we're gonna reference it by name. So previously we created that instance object, we gave it a name, in this case MongoDB1. And then inside this binding object, we're also gonna create the pod preset template. And this is gonna get used to actually create a real pod preset for the Kubernetes core system. In this particular case, I said, okay, find all pods that get created uh, that have a label of app with a value of my app. And so as new pods get created in the system, they will get uh, the secrets from that instance that we're bound to ejected into their pods as we go along. Now, a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about here is kind of an alpha stage, okay? And so as of right now, all of the secret information, in other words, all the keys, will get added as separate environment variables automatically. We are gonna uh, work on adding support for doing bind mounts and stuff like that. It's just not quite there yet if you, if you decide to play with it. But I did wanna mention that at least the basics of it is there, they all appear as environment variables. But at the most part, you should see that this is actually very similar to what you see in Cloud Foundry, right? You create an instance, you create a binding, things magically appear inside your application as environment variables or as, as a single environment variable in the Cloud Foundry case, here's a, as a set of environment variables in the Kubernetes case. Very similar concepts. And that's one of the key things I think that's important in all this work is while the underlying implementation is slightly different from Kubernetes versus Cloud Foundry, the way the user sees it is very, very similar. You know, different syntax in some cases, but the concepts are the same. And I think that's a very important concept going forward here. And it's that level of consistency and pseudo interoperability, I think is gonna be very great for the users in terms of giving them choice in terms of what platform they wanna use because they get similar experiences. So one of the other things that we experienced here is because the model we, we, uh, we added to wasn't part of the core, um, we had to basically create our own little API server, right? That's that little HTTP front end in front of a database. Now, what we had to do those, as I said, created our own little API server, but that's not a great user experience from the client's perspective if they have to talk to two different API servers to, just to get their job done. So Kubernetes has been working on this thing called API aggregator, which basically is kind of like a proxy in front of multiple API servers. And so what we, in, in our case, what we're gonna do is tell people to install this as uh, you know, the normal API server on the left-hand side of the picture there, that's the core API server but then put in front of it an API aggregator, which says, okay, if you see a request that talks about service catalog types of resources, route it over to the service broker API server, which is running outside the core and get your job done. Now the API server for the service broker may still talk back to the core, to the database over there to get its job done. For example, talking to secrets and stuff like that. But from the end user perspective, they see a single endpoint and a single user experience. And this was something that uh, was relatively new um, so we took a lot of arrows and, and pulled out a lot of hair trying to get it all to work. And the same thing for uh, standing up a brand new API server. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Kubernetes, some of the things in there are not necessarily the easiest things in the world to deal with. And we took a lot of hits um, trying to get all this stuff working and ironed out a lot of the bugs because we were really the first ones to use some of these things. So that was actually good for the community at large because we helped enhance the documentation and the experience for using these things. All right. So um, for those of you not familiar with Kubernetes, there is a command line, kubectl, and basically you act on resources, as I said, right? So you can do a kubectl create, update, delete, and you pass in a YAML file describing the resource, okay? Um, so here's some examples of it right there. Now we are planning on doing uh, some plugins to the kubectl command line to make the user experience a little more user friendly, and that's what you see down at the bottom, and those should look very familiar to you to, um, when you look at the Cloud Foundry command line, right? So it's a very similar thing, right? You wanna create an instance, you give the, the service class name, the plan name, what Kubernetes namespace you want it to be visible into, and then the instance name. So very similar to Cloud Foundry. And under the covers, these will create the YAML files appropriately and then call the, basically the equivalent of the kubectl create commands for you. So we're trying to copy Cloud Foundry's wonderful user experience here on the Kubernetes side. So kudos to them because they did a great job. 
Um, so in terms of status, uh, we have a special interest group and an incubator project, both called Service Catalog. We are planning on being fully uh, Service Broker API compliant going forward. Uh, we have uh, IBM, Red Hat, and Google are very involved, obviously, in both organizations, so they've got great synergy between the two. And as I said, a lot of the stuff we have right now is in alpha form. We are very, very close to beta, and that's very important from a Kubernetes perspective, because from a Kubernetes perspective, beta means from an end user, you can assume that the APIs will be stable going forward, right? So you can start playing with it and be assured that we're not going to break you going forward. We may add new things, but you're, you should be backwards compatible, and that's going to be a huge milestone for us, and I think we're less than about a week or two away from that. So at that point, I would feel comfortable telling people to really start playing with it and hammering it and let us know what you guys think. Um, and finally, just some links for you guys to get involved. The top set are for the Open Source Broker API itself. We have a web page, GitHub repo, um, obviously the Cloud Foundry link there, and then a link to the service catalog GitHub repo for Kubernetes. And I believe that's it. Oh, we have office hours tomorrow um, in the collaboration station from 1250 to, to 120. Uh, Shannon and I will be there answering questions. And we do have some funny stickers. Um, funny because they're incredibly small. I've never seen stickers quite this small before. Um, but that, that's it. So, Max, how much time do we have? Oh, we have a whole four minutes for questions. We made it. I was afraid we'd run out of time. <laughs> so, Shannon, you want to come up in case we have questions? You guys are going to have to share. Oh, you need to steal mine? Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. Whoa, that's loud. Um, any questions from the audience? Ah, perfect. So remember, mention your name and association so that we know you. Yeah, you may want to hold it. Yeah, so Luis Amadeo from Ultimate Software. Uh, so is the intention for uh, service brokers to be uh, shareable between Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes uh, once they support the same API? Yeah, by and large, that's the goal. The goal would be that a service provider uh, who wants to offer a service in the marketplace of uh, either platform um, would only need to uh, write one implementation in support of the, the broker API endpoints, and uh, that broker should, you should be able to register that broker with both platforms. Great, thank you. Yeah, the only thing I would add is one of the biggest things, aside from just the, the coolness factor of that, is imagine then a user can then choose well, maybe today I want my application deployed on Cloud Foundry, maybe tomorrow I want on Kubernetes, or vice versa. They should be able to get a similar user experience to use these services. And that's a wonderful interoperability statement to me. I think that's really going to be cool going forward. Cool. Any other questions? I guess a follow up to this does it mean that there will be one service instance that is shared between, say, my deployment on both, or will I create two service instances? That's a harder problem. But uh, I've heard that uh, Bluemax enables this to some extent. Yeah, I was going to say that's basically an implementation detail. Um, being IBM, as we know, Bluemix actually does support this today. You can create an inst a service instance for, say, your Cloud Foundry stuff and get access to it from a Docker container or Kubernetes pods and stuff. And so it is going to be possible to do that kind of stuff, but it's going to be an implementation detail of the platform that supports multiple things. Now, you know. Pivotal supporting Cloud Foundry, IBM possibly supporting Kubernetes, where you could share instances between the comp two completely disjoint platforms. That's going to be much harder and probably not anytime in the near future. But within one platform, I would expect you to, yes. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Wow, well, we're stopping you from lunch. Thank you, Shannon Thank and you Doug. All. Enjoy Appreciate lunch. It.